downloads and the database was surviving. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Well, what we're going to show you today is that, but, but really, really interesting. And this is, you know, this is now across multiple Kubernetes clusters. And, you know, what does that mean for us as, as organizations? And so I'm really excited about this session. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to start video actually, Keith, I'm sorry. I didn't have the intro slide in here. But I am joined by my friend Keith McClellan. Keith, you want to say hello and tell people what your role is? I'm just jumping right into it today. Yeah, really. Like you're so excited about the demo, you don't even want to introduce me. It's totally. Un I understand. It's great. So it my is. name's Keith McClellan. I'm. Uh, I I do partner solutions engineering here at Cockroach Lab. So uh, I uh, I work with the Kubernetes vendors on um, on how Cockroach DB integrates with them, as well as other types of partners. And uh, really excited to to talk to you today about. Cockroach DB on Kubernetes. That's awesome, buddy. And y'all, Keith, uh, Keith has a tremendous amount of experience. Um, I mean, I guess tremendous is all relative, I guess, when you're in the Kubernetes space. I mean, who really, you right? Like, it's like, it's only been around a couple of years, but there are people who who really do get it that I've met along the way. And, and Keith is definitely one of these people who really can get into the weeds of, of a lot of things that are going on here. So I guess, you know, with that, just please do ask us questions um, along the way. There is a QA. Um, there's also a chat function. Um, I'll be monitoring both. I think Keith, you're on both while you're not doing the demo, um, but I'll be on it definitely during the demo and beyond. And I'll, I'll lob questions into Keith and you could feel free to ask me questions along the way. Um, I, I, I do want to express my disappointment though. I'm still uh -oh, in what? Washington, DC and you didn't invite me to come to Denver now that we all can travel and stuff. And I, well, I'm upset. I, I want to come visit. I need to get out of the house. Keith, it's been a week. I did. They 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 told me I wasn't allowed to look like they pulled me out of a dungeon anymore. That's why I have a collar on and everything. I mean, and I'm very, ready to go. That bag's apropos, already packed. You're going back into the dungeon today because you're going to use Cube Doom. I'm sorry, I had to go there, buddy. All right. So <laughs> this is a little. We're going to start with a little bit of a quick intro on just cockroach, just because I want to level set kind of why we can do what we can do that you're going about to see in the demo. Okay. So let me just run through this. We'll get to the demo. And, and like I said, please do ask questions um, and, and QA. And if you, if you like what you're seeing, tweet about it. Keith loves his, his social media. I'm sorry, Keith. I love you too, buddy. So, all right. So Cockroach, um, if you're not familiar with Cockroach, I hope you are. Um, you know, this was a database that was truly architected for the cloud. You know, like I said, when I first saw it, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Um, you know, I've been in the Kubernetes space for really quite some time to see a database kind of act the same way that, you know, a cluster works where, you know, pods come up and down and you see no interruption in service was just, you know, to me, truly phenomenal. And if you think about the core architecture of Cockroach, it, it's very well aligned with Kubernetes. In fact, if you, if, you know, if, if Kubernetes is spawn of Borg, which is kind of the, you know, the original orchestration platform and more within Google, right? Cockroach was really spawned out of, you know, the Google, um, you know, the cloud spanner white paper. And so a lot of the kind of core primitives and the core architectural concepts that are in spanner um, and how well they align with kind of what's happened within, within Kubernetes is, is really here as well. I mean, if you look at the people that define these things, the, you know, the, the Jeff Dean, the Sanjay Gemawat, Eric Brewer, the, the, you know, these Google engineers that, that have really kind of changed the world. A lot of those concepts are here. You know, if you if you really want a, a course in distributed systems, man, go read some of those papers. They're great. But at a high level, you know, one of the choices that the the team here made was that you know we were going to be a a relational database that's distributed. But I think most importantly, and I think a very early decision by um, our CTO Peter Mattis was to make sure that we were going to implement you know standard SQL, uh, and, and then to be wire compatible with Postgres was kind of a key moment in time. I mean. Yeah, Peter, Spencer, and Ben, the founders of the company, came out of Google, by the way. And yeah, you can have something proprietary when you're internal, but you know, for mass adoption and and to fit, you know, the the, the most amount of workloads, you know, being wire compatible with Postgres is important. And SQL syntax. And so, first of all, at the highest level, Cockroach is at least that, right? It's a relational database. Now, um, it is implemented. Oh wait, where? What the? Why is it? Oh man, it's all right. I'm already on Kubernetes. It is actually for Kubernetes, but I'll come back to that. Um, scaling cockroach is really simple. You simply add more nodes and it auto balances to kind of incorporate that new resource, right? Just like you would say in the etcd, like, hey, I want to increase the number of pods I have for this particular service. Great. It's going to go out and do that, right? So the same kind of concept here, and we're going to show you kind of that that's really what's going on underneath the covers. Now, what's interesting in cockroach though, is we aren't just scaling reads, right? 
This is for both reads and writes because every single node in Cockroach can service both reads and writes. Every single node is an endpoint. So you simply just set up a load balancer and start hitting endpoints and you're gonna be able to find the data. Now, when we write data in Cockroach, we're gonna write things in triplicate across multiple nodes so that we can survive failures. We can distribute data, right? We can actually pinpoint where that data is gonna be located as well, which is kind of some cool stuff. But not only can we scale within a single region, we can actually scale across you know, multiple regions. Um, yet still deliver the experience of a single logical database. So you can ask a node in any region for data, and it's going to find that within that cluster. Now, this can actually mean multiple Kubernetes clusters, and that's what Keith is going to show you today. You know, I think one of the things, one of the challenges with Kubernetes is when you do have global deployments and you're, you're running and managing multiple Kubernetes clusters because you know, I think a lot of the work that, that some companies are doing, like, you know, like the work with cross-plane, uh, there's, there's a couple of people trying to figure out how do we manage, you know, multiple clusters, right? Well, that, that and federation is a challenge. Uh, and, and so if maybe if we can consolidate and, and run a single logical database across, you know, multiple clusters, that's a different way of thinking about the problem. The application is now consolidated and, and there's this kind of one common layer of data across all of the clusters, right? Disparate clusters, one single logical database. And that's that's exactly what we're gonna show you today. But people are doing this today. They're also doing it across multiple cloud providers. I was on with one of our customers this morning, a company by the name of Form3. They're over in the UK doing some really, really cool stuff. And from an engineering point of view, wow. You know, right now they're working on a, on a cockroach cluster that is spanning multiple cloud providers because their customers demand that they do that right, just from a pure survivability point of view. And so I've never heard of a single logical database running across multiple cloud providers. I think it's pretty cool. Um, but that is ultimately, I think, you know, where you can end up with, with Cockroach. And that, that's all due to the architecture. Um, we do this so we are naturally resilient. You can survive the failure of, say, an entire cluster, and it will still come back, depending on how you actually roll out your data model. You know, when you roll out a data model in Cockroach, typically when we, we think about a database, you think of it like the the logical model, right? You think about referential integrity, tables, columns, all these things. Well, within a distributed system, you really got to think about um, the, the, the nature of the location of data, the physical model as well. And so, you know, we can at the row level decide where data lives so that when we write to Cockroach, we're actually doing quorum write. So you have to have, you know, two of three copies of data so that you can survive those things. So, you can actually configure things for either, you know, speed of access or surviving a regional failure. Maybe you just want to survive a, a node failure, what, what not. And so there's lots of things that go in here. But, but the interesting thing is, you know, how do you get down to, to a zero RPO? How, you know, how do we have the same kind of concepts of rolling upgrades that you have in Kubernetes? Well, we can do that with a database as well. Again, some of the core primitives and, and core principles of, 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 their, of, of Kubernetes applied here. Now, again, just to give you a really clear example, um, I can ask for data of any node. Any node can service a query. I am asking this particular node, which is in US West, the data, the, the raft leader, if you're familiar with that, uh, we, I'm not gonna get into that. We have an architecture talk that will do that. The raft leader is actually located in the East. That node is smart enough to go out there and get that data and return it back or, or insert that record into this customer table. But we can do these things because maybe that user uh, is located on the East Coast. And now we want really fast access for that user. And so we can actually you know, tie data to a location so that we can actually you know, uh, deal with these, these global read-write latencies. And so this is some of the magic that's in Cockroach. And again, you know, that user being in the East, accessing his record, the RAF leader is there, the, 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 the leaseholder we call it in Cockroach. If you want to learn more about these things, um, Honestly, go to our documentation. Our documentation has some really interesting um, stuff in there that 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 I think explains these things very well. It, the team does a phenomenal job of explaining some of this stuff. So, so that's kind of at the high level, kind of the magic of of what kind of cockroach does. So, Keith, I know you you think about disaster recovery and the concept in the context of you know being cloud native and 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 what we're thinking about from a cluster point of view. Do you want to just walk through kind of the differences between the traditional versus the cloud native world? Yeah, so I mean, traditional disaster recovery is a person bringing up spare infrastructure to try to get back to live, right? Um, sometimes portions of it are automated, but in a lot of cases, you know, somebody has to be woken up at three o'clock yeah. in the morning and expected to like 
you know, go jump on a computer to go to do the 20% that wasn't automated. Um, a lot of times it takes a long time to get back up and running and there's some form of data loss, right? Um, and, and, and Keith, sometimes it is in the middle of the night, but I remember Sean on DoorDash said, it's the hiccup in the middle of the day that really kills me, right? Like it could be any time. Yeah. Yeah. The, the hiccups can be at any time. Um, it's the, they're, when they happen during the day, they have more business impact, but they tend to be, hopefully tend to be shorter. Right. Right. <laughs> the, the ones that happen at night tend to be longer. And so, I mean, you can, you can talk about the, the, uh, that for hours. I'm not going to dig into that. Right. But in a lot of cases, um, we're having to go to like cold storage for backups and your, your infrastructure team is doing a lot of the work to kind of get you back up and running again. Um, fundamentally, I think cloud native disaster recovery is about believing that and designing for things to fail so that it is what we would traditionally think of as a disaster event, losing a data center is now just really an HA event. Right. Um, where we're kind of autonomously failing over to infrastructure that was already provisioned and is already working. Um, that procedure is, um, you know, fully automated. Um, we're gonna we're gonna show that today in a in kind of a tongue in cheek kind of a way, um, with um, you know a recovery time objective of seconds. So before anyone, an administrator, would ever actually be notified that there's a problem. The system has gotten back to a state where it's processing um, and meeting the needs of the business. Um, one of the neat things about the way we're able to do this, particularly at the database level, is we can make it less expensive even than a traditional DR strategy just from an infrastructure overhead perspective, um, which we could talk about if, if we have time today. Um, the process is largely owned by the app team rather than like an infrastructure team. So you don't have that kind of cross um, you know, that cross team friction around trying to get things back up and running. Um, and, um, you know, the biggest, the most kind of important part of, of the infrastructure isn't going to cold storage and making sure you have a good backup. It's making sure you have a robust um, uh, load balancing strategy to make sure that your customers are getting routed to the infrastructure that's, um, that's available to them after a failure. Um, so, there are two things I really like to talk about here. Um, you know, the one of them is just kind of a reminder that something like 70% of all disasters are, are caused by people making mistakes, right? Um, and they tend to be very expensive disasters, right? I think everyone that's ever been an administrator on a system has deleted something they weren't supposed to delete or, um, or blocked network traffic that they weren't supposed to block and brought something down they didn't mean to bring down, right? Um, so, so having a system that's resilient enough to handle that across multiple sites without, um, you know, without a user having to notice they made a mistake, your backup and healthy before anyone realizes that something's broken, it allows you to fix the broken stuff with, um, um, with, purpose rather than um, with kind of a emergency type of energy, right? People make mistakes during emergencies that make the emergencies last longer. Um, if the system's back up and running and healthy, you can kind of figure out what you did and, and fix it the right way rather than trying to scramble to get things back up and running, which is where um, disasters turn into, you know, extended disasters. Um, the other thing, and we're going to be doing a lot of this here today as a part of the demo is Treating Kubernetes itself as kind of the fault domain, right? Um, if we're if we have a single persistent data layer, uh, Cockroach DB, that is spread across multiple Kubernetes clusters, I can lose an entire Kubernetes cluster, and my my user facing applications and my data is all perfectly safe, right? What's great about that is um, I can treat kind of any failure as if it's a site failure and still be confident that everything's gonna work. So I don't have to try to route people to, to a system that's hobbled. If it's not working properly, we can just take it offline, fix it and bring it back online, which is a kind of a great way to, 
to, to try to do your, uh, to administer a system. And I, Keith, honestly, I, I love the concept of thinking of Kubernetes as a failure domain. We think of failure domains as a node, a rack, a server, an AZ a region, a data center. I mean, a cluster being a failure domain, I think it's something that we haven't really thought about. And it's actually, we, we can start to think about that. And I think that's, it's up-leveling the conversation beyond just, you know, a pod being a failure. Like what happens if your whole cluster goes down? I think that's, that, that's really interesting. So... Cool. Um, well, do you want to go through this, what we're about to show then, Keith? Or Yeah, absolutely. So the demo we're going to show you today is a geo-distributed CockroachDB environment that's running across three different Kubernetes clusters that are three different Kubernetes distributions in three different data centers. So one on the East Coast of the US, one in Iowa, that's, uh, that's the Google Central, and then one in on the West Coast um, in Amazon. So, um, so we have 15, actually I think it's not, uh, 18 nodes of CockroachDB provisioned. Um, and, uh, you, just, you just love to spend that money, don't you? Uh, I told you that this demo <laughs> burns money. It's fun. <laughs> I like spending other people's money. It's good times. So Keith, um, I, I, I know we're running an e, you know, EKS, GK, and AKS. I, you know, one of these could be bare metal as well, right? I mean, you could be just running VMs on bare metal, right? Um, I, I do have a version of this demo that um, has a bare metal site running OpenShift too. Um, you know, I yep. love me some OpenShift. Yeah, um, I know. The, um, what's, um, the point here is it doesn't matter what your Kubernetes distributions are, right? And it doesn't matter who the infrastructure provider is, right? That's right. So, um, uh, and we have a single database sing, um, running across all of that. So it's one CockroachDB cluster. We're using um, an open source project called Scupper to build something that's called a VAN, which is a virtual application network. Effectively, it's um, uh, layer seven network tunneling. So it's using uh, MTLS for the, for the folks out in the audience. Um, it's the same type of encryption that you use to like do financial transactions with your bank but negotiated in a bi-directional way um, and shipping um, um, database information across that kind of virtual application network to, so, to allow the nodes to, to stay in sync with one another. Um, so um, do you want to pop to the next slide? Yeah. Um, hey, Keith, at that, at, at that layer, um, and this is kind of a personal question, have you ever seen people using Cilium to do this sort of thing as well? Because I think that's kind of one of those things that the, you know, I, I don't know, have, have you have you seen that product being used? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, we've also done some tests with something called Submariner, yeah. uh, which is an IPsec gateway. So that's like VPN technology, which is, you know, layer three over layer, or layer two over layer three. Yeah. Um, whereas this is layer seven over layer three, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's, um, there are trade-offs to any of these things. Um, you yep. could, we could have peered the networks completely independent of Kubernetes and just done DNS chaining, right? So if, let's say we were in three different sites in Amazon, they make it relatively easy to peer networks across regions, right? So, um, we could have peered the networks, um, you know, across regions and then just done DNS chaining with some, something called core DNS, um, the um, there are a lot of different ways to 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 get to this type of an outcome. Uh, one of the things I like about Scupper is it's pretty easy to get set up, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's probably not the most performant of the solutions that I've worked with, um, but it is the easiest, and it requires the least administrative permissions to do it. Um, I just have to have ingress um, set up. Um, so that I can get like a load balancer IP or whatnot for, yep. for the scupper gateways. And then I'm kind of done. Uh, I don't have to have full admin access to the clusters or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but as far as kind of the rest of it goes, they, like there's a ton of different ways to do this. And, you know, we've talked customers through probably a half a dozen different architectures. Um, I think the point is the database doesn't care. 
Right, we exactly. Have, the database nodes just have to be t- able to talk to each other. Well, and I think, you know, Keith, people are using Scupper and other things basically, I mean, to communicate between compute across these different things. For us, it's just the database is just that, that is, we're just another application on top of Kubernetes, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some special things we're doing, but, you know, th- I think for anybody out there is playing with these things, I, I, that's really good advice. So, and, and by the way, anybody, I, somebody was asking me, what's the name of the technology? And, and I'm sorry, autocorrect will always autocorrect scupper to skipper. I, I don't know how to like, you know, so, but it works. Yep. Um, scupper.io, I think. Yeah, um, that's right. So there's a question, would you use scupper for production? Um, probably not quite yet. Um, although I, I've been impressed with how rapidly they've been making progress on that project. Um, the, I think it probably depends on kind of your comfort level with troubleshooting problems that you might run into with it. Um, well, you know, why don't we table that for a little bit? And if yeah. you'd like to have a follow-on conversation at the end, we can talk about the... And is it is it an open source project, Keith? It is absolutely an open source project. Yeah, so the, team, I mean, can... the team over there is very um, um, communicative. Um, I had a bug yeah. when I was originally building this demo and they they put a patch in Scupper for me in like three days. It was awesome. Yeah. I, I just, I love this community, honestly. They're so reactive and people want to help. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. They're so, making great so, progress on Scupper for sure. Yeah. So, um, so we're running um, an industry standard benchmark called TPCC, which is for relational databases. We're running an instance of it in each of the three data centers so that I could show off some, some load running everywhere. Um, and then we're going to use Kubedoom in one of the data centers to go kill some pods in a in the funnest way I could come up with. Bloody, it's very bloody. Bloody yeah. killing of pods. I, yeah. I lied, by the way, before. I'm running 27 pods. Yeah, of you do TV. like to burn the money, don't you? I'm burning. I'm burning the, uh, the money down. I'm burning it down. Keith, what kind of workload do we have in TPCC? How many warehouses? Is it like a small, like a thousand, a hundred? Is it, what are, what are you running in this? Yeah, demo? I think I'm running 300 warehouses for yeah, this. That's pretty scenario. decent traffic. Uh, you know, a hundred yeah. warehouses per site. Um, you know, I could scale this up um, pretty easily, but I didn't actually do any performance um, right. in, um, tuning on, uh, on any of the tables. So yeah. um, to do that, I would have had to have gone and like, actually intentionally set up a, a benchmarking environment. I'm using TPCC because it's convenient for generating load, not because I was trying to show off the performance. It is. Well, and, and convenient as well, because it's, it's, it's part of the product. Like we ship the TPCC workload in Cockroach, in, in the binary itself. So if, if anybody's wanted to test this kind of thing, you, you can actually run it. Just if you do a search on our documentation for Cockroach demo, um, you'll find the various different workloads that you can run. So it's kind of easy for us to actually just spin up and, and being an industry standard workload, I think is actually really, really important. This isn't something we made up to show off Cockroach. You know, this is as, as close to TPCC, our implementation of it is as possible as we can get. You know, we're working really hard to look at this workload and say, okay, what, what would have to change within that industry benchmark to be distributed um, as we go through? And you know, gosh, man, we benchmark, we run this every night. Right. I think it's part of our, our, our I mean, teardown every night is we're running TPCC to see where, you know, what, what performance bottlenecks have happened and whatnot. So if you actually want to do it, that, that workload is in the binary. Um, yeah. I, I use so. TPCC with customers all the time just to make sure that the cluster is configured properly. Yeah. Um, because we run it internally so much that I can get a pretty good sense of how performant um, a customer's <laughs> environment should be at a given size based on our like rather copious results of yeah. running TPCC on different node sizes. We even published the cloud report, um, which is like something we do annually to kind of benchmarks the different clouds. So that, um, which is really just a culmination of the work we were already doing anyway. Um, so that we knew that um, it, we it could track so much more than that. Come on, it, man. You're it's right. A lot it's absolutely work. a lot more than that, but yeah. Um, but it's a great reference for this type yeah. of stuff. So yeah. there was a question in the chat. Uh, what's the replication configuration in our case where um, all of the TPCC data is replicated three times. So there's a, a replica of each record in all three sites, yeah. the way I have it set up currently. Well, shall we kill some pods? Let's do it. I'm loving this demo. I'm loving this session today, Keith. 
So you and I haven't done this in a while. I'm I know it. what's been going on, man. I know, I know. Oh, I know what's been going on. I had to go build the Kubernetes operator, and I didn't. That's have right. To do the fun stuff for a little. That's while. exactly right. So, um, so I have a 27 node CockroachDB cluster um, running across Azure, GCP, and AWS. Well, um, multi-cloud application. Multi-cloud, just... multi-Kubernetes distribution, multi-site. It's it's all of the multis that I could put in. I I, I just I always like saying that because if anybody follows Quinny Pig on on Twitter, he's very anti multi cloud, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna send him a little clip of this later. So today. we're running uh, the guy. we're running about a thousand transactions per second. Um, P99 latency. I could have tuned this down to a couple hundred milliseconds for for some of the analytics queries. If you're not familiar with TPCC, it runs it's like a seventy percent transactional, thirty percent OLAP workload. So this is a good blend of short and long running queries. Um, and um, as you can see, I am, I've got a lot of stuff going on. Okay. So I've got load generators running in each of the regions and I'm outputting kind of the, the pod list for the region where I'm running kubedoom, um, which is going to then go ahead and show us, um, I'm going to show now. So. Uh, Kubedoom, if you're not aware, um, in software at some point in the late 90s, open sourced um, Doom, the original Doom for the community. And uh, some, some folks got it running in Docker first, then got it running in Kubernetes. And then um, someone added onto that project a way of when you kill demons in Doom, it kills pods in, um, in a Kubernetes cluster. So, um, What's likely going to happen is we're going to kill a bunch of pods. Um, because of the way I have Kubedoom set up, it might kill itself. So if the, the actual Doom window crashes, that's because it like I committed Harry Carry. And, um, and we're going to see that the database is kind of self-recovering. The, the load generator in the region, which is uh, Azure East, may actually go down because I might end up killing that pod too. But we'll see that the load generators and the other two sites continue to run while we're doing this. So, so Keith, gonna, you're you're killing no, you're killing pods in Azure East just to make sure. I'm killing pods yeah. in Azure East. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run through this. And, and you entered all your cheat codes. I did. I, I definitely have to cheat at Doom still. It's only <laughs> been 30 years and I'm still cheating at Doom. So I'm killing a bunch of pods. I know this is super exciting to watch the pods die. Um, so I just killed a bunch of pods, including myself. I got a, a couple of database pods died on us. Um, and the database is still going. Is everything back already? Yeah. Um, let's go to the node list. Um, it, the funny thing about, so this cluster has been running for a little bit. Um, Looks like we're waiting on one node. Um, we have a couple of nodes that are down that are coming back online right now, actually. Uh, East two and East three. And now and now the, the admin UI is trying to catch up. So basically you, you killed the node that was first in the admin UI. Is that what happened or is it just catching up, Keith? The admin UI is just catching up, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because the admin UI in Cockroach can be hit by any on any node, right? I mean, you could point this at any node, you're going to get the admin UI, correct? Correct. So you could have killed, like, if you were servicing this from a pod in the east or a node in the east, and you had killed it, this would have gone down. But like this particular connection to basically the, the metrics of the cluster, right? That is correct. Yeah. I think what actually happened in this case is that I um, overwhelmed my actual laptop from running too much stuff. Because mm. you got very hard to hear, so I think I may my internet connection may have flaked out there for a second. Well, we can still hear you very well. Well, that's um, good. It's your it's uh, it's incoming. So let me go ahead and um, I think what happened was my tunnel died. Hold on a sec. 
What can go wrong well in a demo? Um, yep, my tunnel died. So let me go ahead and fix that real quick. I love watching you type, Keith. It's I know, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. So somebody was asking, are all three Kubernetes clusters the same version? Um, they're, I don't know if they're the same version of Kubernetes, but they are basically, it's EKS, AKS, and GKE. Yeah, they're three so different distributions. They're three I different distributions. I'm pretty sure they're not all the same version of, of Kubernetes. I don't think they are, actually. I think, I think one is .18 and one is right. .9, and two of them are .19, if yeah. I remember correctly. Um, the database is still running, but my connection to the GUI is, um, is struggling at the moment. Let me, um, get there. Let me try one last thing real quick. I'm going to try a different pod. Hmm. So you're connected to that central GKE cluster? Yeah, I'm connected to Google. Yep. I can connect to the AWS cluster as well if I need to. Yeah. Backup should have been just give me these commands and I run it from here. Um, I, I can do that. I'd have to send you the command. Yeah, the you, know, file. you don't need me in terminal, dude. That's, I, you know, that nobody needs to see that. But I think it's, I, the point is, is I could have accessed this from here as well. Like, I, and I think it's like, yeah, you can hit any of the pods to actually get the DB console. You can hit any of the pods to get the DB console. If you can Absolutely. get to them. Um, that's, that's correct. If you can get to them, then that works just fine. Um, let me, let me switch to the, uh, to AWS real quick. Okay. Have you ever seen this week in Kubernetes, Keith? Where Joe, Beta, where Joe Beta gets on and he like tests out a new product and things go wrong and he has to like figure it out and troubleshoot i don't know if here if anybody's ever seen that but it's it's good fun sorry everybody but sometimes this is what happens it is sometimes what happens the database is still running we're still generating load and consistent data in the background remember like all these transactions are guaranteed consistent i mean yeah so this is a true multi-master cluster uh and database so Oh, and we want to show you the, the the latencies of the queries as well. Uh, we'll get there, um, but we'll show that we'll show that off as well and some of the stuff that's in the metrics here. Yeah, my internet is acting up. That's this is very interesting. Let me stop sharing my screen real quick and okay. then see if um, see if I can fix this while we're chatting in the background. So there was a question really early on for a three cluster database. Do we need four load balancers, one for each cluster and then one for directing to the three load balancers? Um, I think that really depends on what you want to do with your setup. Do you want a single point in across three clusters running in a single region so you can fail those, you know, survive those? Yeah, at that um, point, you know, you're probably, at that point, you're, you're looking at something like Cloudflare or something. Exactly, like yeah. But if you're going across, you know, three data centers geographically dispersed, like Keith is doing here, um, you know, you're going to have a load balancer in each region. You want that because you want users to access the local cluster so that, you know, they're driving down latency of, of, of you know, the access time. Oh, good news. As soon as I um, stopped sharing my screen, oh, look at that. Back. I have so one. Basically, note. Zoom did this to you, you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so I have one dead node that hasn't quite come back yet. Um, still, that, 
which means that I also, I probably killed the scupper gateway and the node. And so now the node can't reconnect to the rest of the other nodes. Um, uh-huh. It will eventually heal itself if we give it a long enough time. Um, the, um, but we continue to process transactions while all this was going on. Um, we can go ahead and see where we're still, we're still kind of firing away at um, um, transactions. We got a thousand transactions per second. The entire cluster's healed itself, which is, which is great. Um, we lost a couple of, it looks like we lost a couple of minutes worth of metrics, but. So it looks like you, oh, that's just, that's, we didn't lose the cluster. What you're saying, Keith, is we probably lost what? Five minutes of metrics? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we lost some metrics, but everything healed itself, which is pretty yeah. cool. And again, somebody was asking here, how do you prevent getting locked out from the admin panel? Have all three of the data centers admin panels, actually every single node in Cockroach can access the admin panel. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing is I just connected yeah. to a different node and then um, right. some, something that was going on in the background, which is stopping me from, from reaching the... Right, um, but more, more explicitly, Keith, you don't have to set up a separate instance somewhere to service the metrics out of that region. No, it's every single node is, right. a, a, you know, is going to serve up the, the admin, the, the DB console UI, just to be explicitly clear on that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, I definitely killed the Kube Doom pod. That one's gone. I'd have to go mm-hmm. restart that. Way to go. You just <laughs> went off. Well, I mean, I did put myself in God mode, so I didn't die before I committed Harry Carey. That's all. So what other questions do we have from, um, from, the, from the chat? Um, let's see here. So people are asking for you to share some of the, uh, the, the setup and the documentation on this. I think our documentation is a pretty good job, but Keith, you have a bunch of stuff on configuring Scupper and some other things too that you're working on that you'll publish to your Git repo, right? Yeah, as soon as I have the chance to clean it up. Right now it's just a bunch of scratch space. Like I have the readme uh, that I'm working on at the moment. Um, Yeah. But I do definitely need to set up some documentation for it. Yeah, and we'll we'll probably end up um, writing a blog post on this um, post event. So we'll, maybe we just wait to publish that Keith until like some of that stuff is in a better state so that everybody can actually access and do this sort of thing. So absolutely. All right. Let's see. Wouldn't it be cool to have the request forwarded to active nodes for accessing the DB, DB console? Uh, in a real environment, that's what we would have done. I used kube cuddle to port forward the GUI from one of the nodes because that was what was convenient for the demo. Um, yeah. In a real environment, a real, I mean, production environment, you would have a load balancer um, that would load balance our public Kubernetes service. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, I th- I'm trying to translate this one. Do you see the one in chat, the last, the last question, Keith? It's about blockchain for security, for managing IP addresses. Yeah, that's more of a networking thing, right? Yeah. Um, the, um, so, so the question I think is, I think IP addresses of pods could be managed in Cockroach as a world state for blockchain for security, right? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, you could run Cockroach DB to run like a globally consistent multi-site Kubernetes cluster if you wanted to sub it in for etcd i don't think anyone's ever actually done that but yeah in theory you could do that for sure um the um the there was um what our friends at red hat published a blog recently about using keycloak with cockroach db which is kind of a identity and access management platform that um that you can use for like session management so if a customer disconnects and reconnects to another node that they can retrieve their session information. Um, and he wrote a great blog post about how you could theoretically uh, use CockroachDB as a backend store to make that a multi-site solution and not just a multi-node solution, um, which is pretty neat. I think that might apply to, to what we're talking about here as well. Yeah. Um, you know, using blockchain for security, you know, blockchain's immutable, right? Um, so I think the question there is, you know, do you actually require immutability or do you just require the security? 
right? Um, uh, if you needed a mutable data store, then you know integrating with something like a blockchain solution could make sense. Yep. Well, cool. Um, any other questions out there while we while we're still here? Um, I have a couple questions about the operator and what's going on there, Keith. Before we get into that, um, but anything else from the crowd about that? I mean, what we saw was a a database, a single logical database, running across three different clusters in three different cloud providers. Which I'm sorry, dude, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, it's a dream, and I think it's really really cool. So, um, and then I think you know we saw killing these things in the database just we didn't see much impact, uh, you know, the database to heal itself, pods heal themselves and the cluster keeps going. Right. And that's just basically the replication of data and the database heals. Um, I think before we lost the, the DB console, you'll see, you saw something called under replicated ranges. And it was, I think we were at like 24 or something key, something like that. Right. Yeah. And a range is like a shard or, or a tablet, whatnot. And it's just the way that we write data in triplicate uh, at, at 512 megabit ranges. And so that's really what happened right now. So, um, so actually Keith, so what you think right now, the main point of failure was the van, right? The connection to the van. If the connection gets lost on everything, would you then lose quorum vote? I mean, is the database still functional, right? So let's say, yeah. So is that the single point I can of lose, failure? I can lose the entire site and we're fine. Yeah. Because it's not, with Scupper, you're doing point-to-point -point negotiations between the data centers. There's no like central server. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a Scupper router that lives in each of the three sites. So if the Scupper router, say, were to go down, that entire site would go down, but the other two sites would be would be fine. So, yeah. um, so you would still, the database would still be able to maintain quorum and continue to process out of the other two sites. Um, what, what wouldn't happen necessarily is... Um, you know, you would lose all of the pods at a single site at once. That's all. And then it really comes down to, from the quorum point of view, it comes down to how you have architected the data for each of the, the tables at, at the row oh. level, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, so I want to be able to survive the failure of a complete region. Great, right? You know, I want to copy in each of the three regions. That's what people would do. And you're still going to have quorum. Right. However, if you want fast access or fast writes, maybe you have all three copies in a single region, in which case, yeah, you might access. The, yeah, like, but it's, it's, it comes down to like the topology and the trade-offs, right, Keith? Yeah. So, so there's always a consideration of the distribution of the data as, as to whether or not any particular record is going to be available. So the database will be available regardless. Um, but you might have unavailable data if you were to say force all of your replicas to be in a single site. Right. There's some regulatory reasons why you might have to do that, by the way. Um, so, you know, if you're working in a, an environment in California or in EMEA, you, you know, you're, you might be obligated to keep all of the, your customer's data in a single data center, right? Um, in that case, if you're in the cloud, make sure you you're properly marking your availability zones. I didn't do that in this cluster. I only yeah. did a two-tier topology, cloud, and then region. I could have done a three-tier topology and added um, um, added uh, availability zone. And then yeah. I would have been, I could theoretically have up replicated all of these ranges to nine, all these tables to nine, and then been had a, a replica of each record in each availability zone. If I was really paranoid, um, that, that's probably a little overkill for most use cases, but there's certain cases where you might want to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the important thing really is to think about what do I need to survive and what legal obligations do I have um, around the data? And then what kind of performance characteristics do I need? Right. Yeah. Um, you, you kind of, and you kind of do them in that order, right? Um, maybe you do the legal one first, depending on whether or not maybe. you're talking to a lawyer. Yeah. Um, but um, well, I think, it, Keith, it's just a really important point. It's thinking through the physical nature of the data in the context of, of, a, of a database, which is something we just never had to do before. And, and this is, these are the reasons why. So I certainly haven't had to do it since um, I was in college when we had to do physical topology maps for, for data modeling in a college class. Really? Yeah. Well, it was because of the, when it used to be that um, even in like a, like a single, like if you were using a database on a mainframe and you were using off 
uh, off mainframe storage, say like a SAN, right? You had to think, think about the physical topology of which disks were going to get which tables and that way and how you were going to replicate across the SANs and stuff. It was, this is kind of the same skill set, but at a global scale. Um, but I won't, I won't make any more data geek jokes. I'm not okay, geek. Talk about that I'm nerd. This. So uh, there was another question that came in. What about dedicated network networking routes, like a AWS Direct Connect? Have you ever used anything like that, Keith? Would that work in this context? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, have think... a bunch of customers that do that kind of stuff in production, particularly yeah. if you're running a hybrid workload where you have say two physical data centers and you're bringing in Amazon or Azure or GCP as your third site, right? That, yeah. um, then direct connect leases are, um, are definitely going to add some value. Um, yep. you know, there are some, special considerations there but um you know if, if uh, uh if you're interested we should maybe we could have a follow-on conversation yeah. about how you how you need to lay out your data center topology across the united states to make sure that um you know certain power failure dynamics don't um don't take your take you out um did you know we have only three full like power grids in the united states Everything fails, remember. That's right. You have the yeah. East and West interconnects. And then, of course, Texas has their own yeah. interconnect because it's Texas. Well, because it's Texas. So let's talk. Um, so somebody's asking about um, rights in a, in a, in a, in a multi-cluster DB setup. And, you know, are we writing in one region and simultaneously each node in each cluster will receive that data first? Or does it get replicated across nodes in the cluster? So... Basically, Keith, I mean, explain, I mean, writes and cockroach are special. I mean, they're atomic, right? Like I, when I write, I'm writing to all three replicas. Like I don't commit until all three replicas get committed, right? Two of the three. So Two, I'm sorry. Yeah. Quorum, right. Exactly. So we, so we write to the, so um, each range, which is what we call a shard of the database. Um, that's um, like a segment of the key space for any given table is or we call it a range um, has a raft um, group associated with it. So we write to the raft log for that group and that write gets propagated to any replicas of that raft log. Um, the database doesn't return that that write has been committed until uh, a quorum of the participants in that raft group have accepted that write. Um, so what ends up happening is we use uh, the raft log like, um, like a transaction, like in Oracle, you would use a transaction log. Um, that write also gets persisted to our KV store, um, which is Pebble, which is um, uh, a re-implementation of RocksDB in Golang, um, which is pretty neat. Um, so um, for, for the database to acknowledge a write as complete, it has to have been written to the raft log in the KV store on, on a quorum of the nodes that are participating in that particular raft group. Right. Um, it, it is important to remember that we're we're tuned for transactional processing, not for OLAP. Right. So so the vast majority of our rights are only going to touch a couple of those raft groups at any given time, or maybe even one in a lot of cases if you're doing a single record insert. Um, so um, so it sounds like it would be a really expensive operation. It's really whatever your local replica is, plus its next nearest replica has to acknowledge that right before it's committed. Um, so. So long story short, this isn't like write somewhere and then asynchronous replication out to somewhere. It's nothing gets committed until two of the three go. Right. And if that's in two data centers, that's great. It's in two data centers. It's, it can be in a single, it, like that's the, I mean, that's the trick with cockroach, right? I mean, that's the, that, that is, I mean, it's an atomic commit of the, of the transaction itself. So um, are there any configurations for raft timeouts if latencies are different among the data centers, Keith? So um, this, is the, this is the spot where we're a little bit different from Google Cloud Spanner. Yeah. Right? So, so Cloud Spanner uses atomic clocks. Um, and then um, to keep the time synchronization um, uh, across sites as, as close as possible. And then it pauses basically every access to a key. Um, if there's been a recent write to a key space, it pauses your read. Um, it pa or pa it pauses all writes by some window, which is the skew for their um, 
um, of their, their atomic clocks. Whereas what we do is we use something called the hybrid logical clock, which we have a great blog post on how this works, where each raft group effectively agrees on a wall time. And then um, if, a, if a read comes in during the, what's called the uncertainty window of, the, of a write, we, we just hold off on responding on that read until the uncertainty window for the, for the most recent write closes. That way we, we know that we're always returning the, la the last version of, or the latest version of that record. Um, there is a way of retrieving um, effectively a snapshot of the data um, as of a particular time, uh, which we call follower reads, where we don't guarantee that it's the latest version, but we do guarantee it's consistent as of the timestamp you give us for the read, um, uh, which we call follower reads or as of system time reads, right? Yeah. Um, so um, that's kind of a really high level description of how it works. We have something like a 4,000 word blog post that um, several folks have co-authored over the years. That's a great um, follow-up for this. I'd, I'd recommend that the person in the chat who's interested in digging in further, uh, take a look at, at, at yeah, how we that, do it under the covers. And that blog post is, I think, living without atomic clocks is the post, yeah, yeah, right? So just right. cockroach labs and living with without atomic clocks. Um, I actually, I think it's our all time, it, it is our all time most trafficked post. Uh, it's updated all the time too. Yeah. Like I've seen it. Like, I think we update it forever. Every time we make a change to the way we handle, um, handle transactions, I think we keep that blog post up to date. Yeah. Cool. All right, Keith. Well, I think we've gotten a lot of questions. Let's just finish out. I want to ask you a couple things about, um, you know, we get asked all the time, do we have an operator or not? Um, where are we at on our operator, Keith? Like we had one version and now you have a second one that's coming out soon. You've spent a lot of time over the past couple of months, right? Yeah. So this, the operator that we're, we're, we're shipping for, it's currently in, I'll, I'll call it limited availability, right? You can use it. Um, um, there's certain circumstances where, where we would support it. It's going to be a generally available operator here soon, very soon. Like, I think we're talking matter of, of weeks here, probably. Um, the, the operator currently is designed for managing cockroach to be in a single Kubernetes cluster. So it's supposed to make it easy to deploy the database, keep it up to date. So doing rolling upgrades, um, rolling out configuration changes in a way that you won't accidentally like um, bring the cluster down. Um, one of the things we, we have discovered over the last few years is CockroachDB is really easy to run on Kubernetes, um, uh, but there's certain day two operations that customers need to do, like upgrading the binary, where, um, where you're intentionally gonna be like restarting all the pods. Um, and, and we can make that safer by, by automating it using a Kubernetes operator. So, so that's what we've done. Cool. Awesome. So that's just a couple of weeks away. I'm excited to get it out there as well. I think the, I love your comment. It's pretty easy to run Cockroach on Kubernetes, honestly. I think, you know, what we showed here was a very advanced version where we're, you know, linking clusters, which is pretty awesome. But I mean, there's a pretty simple way to do this as well. And I think, you know, I keep running across my old friends from CoreOS and other places using CockroachDB now, uh, you know, in, in these future applications they're building, which is, I just, I find it wonderful. I, you know, this is a database that was kind of built for this new world. So um, thank you, Keith. That was great. Uh, sorry for the troubles. And, you, you know, you literally shot yourself in the foot, I think. Um, well, but yeah. the database healed itself. Exactly. Yeah. The only thing I had to do was just kind of wait it out, which is so, great. You're like the, the, the stainless steel terminator guy. It just gets a hole in them and it comes back. Right. Like, so exactly. So lots of people using cockroach y'all. If you want to learn more about cockroach, there's cockroach university. Uh, the team does a great job of, of building up coursework. Uh, we don't have anything as advanced as what we show today, but there's some really good things about learning some of the basics about cockroach DB and, you know, building applications against that and, and distributed systems. Um, uh, we're constantly uh, adding new coursework here, so so stay up to date there. And then finally, if you want to go and actually use Cockroach right now, um, you know, Cockroach Cloud is our database as a service. Uh, you go out and spin up a cluster, you up and run in a minute. Um, we actually have a version of this, which is called uh, the Cockroach Cloud, the serverless free trial. 
uh, or actually the forever free tier, you know, we're building a serverless version of this database where, you know, I want to, I want to, I don't want anybody to think about the database. I want a database to be a SQL API in the cloud and be done with it. Um, and I think that's kind of really cool. And so, you know, stay tuned there. Um, but we do have a version of that you can play with today. But a lot of the stuff that you saw that Keith did, um, you know, you, you can use in, in Cockroach DB core, you can see the admin UI, the, the workloads are all there. So um, there's lots of stuff that you can do with, with the core version as well. So um, with that, uh, Keith, again, thank you. Uh, it has been way too long since we've done anything like this. Uh, it's been months, dude. We were usually like once a month. So um, thank you, buddy. I can go back in the rotation now that we're getting the operator out to GA. So I know, I know, I know. Um, thank you profusely. I, I love this with you, Keith. You're one of my most favorite people to work with. Um, and, and one of the most intelligent, I'm not going to, you know, you're up there. All right. We um, got a lot of smarties here. It's good. We do. We do. We do. Um, but uh, thank you everybody for joining us today, um, both within the, the, the official, like this stream and, and on YouTube and everywhere else that we're streaming these things. Um, the, the details of this will be available online. A replay of this will be up in our Cockroach DB uh, YouTube stand channel. Um, I think, believe, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put an SLA out there. I never do it, but it's always within like an hour. It's this afternoon. Okay. Y'all um, share it with your friends. If you saw something interesting, um, download, use this stuff. I, I really hope everybody enjoyed this. At the end of this, we're going to send a survey out as, as always. We, we are really, um, we pay a lot of attention to the to the results in that survey. So good, bad, ugly, please do send us some feedback. And uh, as JP said, the video will be up on uh, our YouTube channel within an hour. So with that, again, thanks, Keith. All right, buddy. Cool. 